Hello and welcome to Weapons and Warfare for Straight Arrow News. I'm your host, Ryan Robertson, and we've got a great lineup of stories for you this week. We visit with a startup that could help the military solve its billion dollar parts problem. Plus, we're taking a look at some next level radar tech that can predict lightning strikes before they happen. And we get an update on the Navy's next generation air refueler from the folks responsible for getting it in the air. But first, some headlines you may have missed. After a largely unsuccessful attack by Iran on April 13th, Israel responded and sent a message to Tehran. But not in a way Israel's allies, nor a majority of its citizens, really liked. After taking out close to 300 drones, ballistic missiles, and cruise missiles with the help of the U.S., Britain, France, and Jordan, Israel responded nearly a week later with a strike on Iranian air defense systems in central Iran. The Iranian regime says the strike on the Russian-made radar and missile launchers did not happen. The Israelis and satellite imagery beg to differ. It's another layer to an already incredibly tense situation in the Middle East where Israel is under immense scrutiny for the continued assault on Hamas and Gaza, an assault that critics say created a humanitarian crisis and a mountain of global pressure on Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to ease up on his offensive assault. While all of this is happening, the U.S. Congress passed an aid bill for Israel and Ukraine, among other allied partners. $61 billion of the $95 billion package is headed to Ukraine, marking the first significant financial aid from the U.S. since 2022. In addition to the aid package, Ukraine's F-16s will be arriving in-country soon as well. Once the fourth-gen fighter jets from Norway, Denmark, and the Netherlands do arrive, they will be equipped with, quote, longer-range strike capabilities, end quote. That's according to Norwegian Foreign Minister Espen Barth Eid, speaking in Ukraine. While he was mum on the number of F-16s destined for Ukraine, he did say it was a, quote, significant number. Also not provided an expected delivery date. However, in March, Dutch Prime Minister Mark Rutte agreed to speed up the jet's delivery to Ukraine. And bad news for the USS Boxer. Just days after the amphibious assault ship set sail for a deployment to the Indo-Pacific, it was forced to make a U-turn and head back to San Diego. A statement from the 3rd Fleet said the WASP-class assault ship was returning from its first deployment in five years for, quote, additional maintenance in support of its deployment. This is the latest setback for the ship, which has been plagued by maintenance problems since returning to the fleet from a $200 million overhaul that started in 2020. The U.S. military is at the cutting edge of modernization in many ways, but it still depends on pieces of equipment that are more than a half century old, and that's simply because those platforms still work. Long live the buff. But when those systems break down and need repair, getting the parts can be a problem. The introduction of 3D printing helped, but it's not a cure-all. The Air Force thinks it may have found an answer to its replacement parts problem, though, in a Southern California startup. The answer is called the Robotic Craftsman. Built by Machina Labs, it's not a 3D printer, more of a 3D shaper. It uses essentially robot fingers to form parts out of sheet metal. It is not limited to shaping just one kind of part either. The Craftsman can shape countless configurations. Mike Polino, the VP of product at Machina Labs, says that's a big deal when you're talking about something a unit may only need one or two of a year. So we call it the robotic craftsman very intentionally. Um, you know, throughout history, metal craftsmen had this like almost unlimited agility. They could pick up a different tool, learn a new craft, and make something new. So maybe a helmet one day, a shield the next day, a tea kettle the day after that. So in, in you know, the modern manufacturing context, we needed a lot more scale. So we got rid of all that agility in favor for very fixed tooling that would help us stamp out like many, many, many parts. For the crews responsible for maintaining and repairing the entire array of vehicles at the military's disposal, the robotic craftsman can be a game changer, drastically reducing the amount of time any given platform is out of service. 
with our system, we're seeing one week lead times for parts, where previously you might have nine month, 10 month, 12 month lead times uh, for a single sheet metal part to re repair an airplane. They know this because they're already seeing the results. In November of 2023, Machina Labs installed one of their systems at Warner Robins Air Force Base in Georgia. Robins is home to the Air Material Command's logistics complex. They provide everything from parts and pieces to engines and missiles. So having something that can, in just a few days, replace a part that hasn't been made for decades is revolutionary. And they've been really amazing partners. They're absolutely leading the charge in new techniques and sustainment. Um, so they've helped us collect requirements and been good thought partners and also just generally helped fund uh, some of the R&D, which is really important to us. If you're wondering how important, a report by Defense One says the Air Force is asking for one and a half billion dollars for parts alone in the next fiscal year. Add to that the looming threats of Russia and China and the need to get this kind of technology to cruise in the field becomes even more important. Our current version of the system actually folds up into a standard shipping container format and can be deployed anywhere by rail or by plane. Um, so you know, being forward, being in, in contested environments, being able to inspect and then reproduce parts that maybe go through battle damage uh, is a big part of our mission. Serving you clarity through context, our mission at SAN is to deliver the news straight down the middle. We're different from mainstream media because we spotlight distorted headlines and show you how to do it too. Discover stories that right and left leaning outlets are choosing not to cover by using our Media Mist tool. Download the SAN app and turn on notifications to have straight facts delivered right to your phone or tablet and get straight facts anytime at san.com. All right, folks, it's time once again for our Weapon of the Week. And this week, we have an entry that's a little bit different. We're actually talking about Honeywell's RDR 7000 weather radar. And with me to kind of discuss this, break it down, everything that it means is Adam Gavrich with Honeywell. Adam, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. So RDR 7000 weather radar, maybe the most advanced radar that you've ever been in contact with? Uh, as far as weather radar is concerned, is definitely best in class. So this radar is designed be used on everything from helicopters to fixed wing aircraft and it's really designed to detect significant weather so that crews can avoid it and keep their flight safe and efficient. Um, what's really unique about this radar is number one its size. So we can do a, a host of very advanced functions as far as weather detection is concerned um, and just using this single unit so it's very easy to install on aircraft. The other very uh, special feature of this is that it's continuously scanning. So traditional radars, you, the crews have to manually control the radar tilt to get a good picture. This is continuously scanning the volume of sky in front of the aircraft. And then we have some very special algorithms that analyze that and uh, intuitively display to the crew the most significant weather. So it's going to reduce their workload in the cockpit, again, let them focus more on flying the aircraft rather than trying to operate the radar. When it comes to hazard features, uh, it does some very unique things as well. We can predict lightning five to 10 minutes in advance using a, what we call a reflectivity analysis. Five to 10 minutes in advance. Five to 10 minutes in advance. And we actually will, on top of the, the radar returns, put symbology showing where that, late, where that lightning is predicted to be so that the crews can avoid those areas. It's very important for helicopters, especially to avoid the lightning. We can also detect hail and uh, predict turbulence out to 60 nautical miles. So um, those are really the core radar features um, from a weather perspective. In the helicopter market, one very, very unique feature that no one else is really doing is we have a maritime surveillance function. So this radar in a certain mode can actually be used for search and rescue operations and oil and gas operations uh, to, to pick up vessels and oil rigs on the ocean and display those on the returns as well. So, uh, you know, in the military space, um, you know, our search and rescue type operations and operators, uh, they find that very, very valuable, especially since, again, it's all, it's all right here in one radar. Because of its size, are you able to potentially put this on, you know, attributable aircraft or like smaller UAVs at, at some point? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. So the whole assembly weighs uh, about 15 pounds. Um, this is a 12-inch antenna. We offer bigger antennas, but they're on certain class UAVs. We could absolutely put this weather radar on uh, and get that get that situational awareness for the for the operators. So. 
Right. Sounds good, Adam. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. And that'll do it for this edition of Weapon of the Week. And the reason why we did this, guys, is because the warfighters, they need to be safe. Otherwise, their weapons are going to be useless. Time now for Comps Check. And this week, we're getting an update on the MQ-25 Stingray. Built by Boeing, we featured the Stingray as our Weapon of the Week earlier this month. And while we were at the Sea Airspace 2024 Expo, we were lucky enough to catch up with the folks from Boeing to get a status report on the Navy's first-of-its-kind refueler. It's not a stretch to say the MQ-25 Stingray is a force multiplier and a force extender. Once integrated into the fleet, this autonomous flying gas can will free up an F-18 and its pilot from flying refueling missions. It will also extend the range of their aircraft. So one of our key performance parameters is being able to deliver 14,000 pounds of gas at 500 miles from the aircraft carrier. In actual fact, we can deliver 15,600 pounds, so exceeding the Navy's desired KPP. Um, and what that will do is it will take two F-35s for a thousand mile mission set. In February, Boeing delivered the first Stingray to the Navy for evaluation. And soon, according to John Scooty, the MQ-25 business development lead for Boeing, they'll take the next step in putting it to work full time. First, refly, because we've already flown and tanked aircraft and taken it to an aircraft carrier and done tests on the flight deck, will be next May or June. And at that point, no holds barred. We'll be flying the aircraft, working with the Navy to get to IOC, the initial operating capability, in 2026. While the prospect of this unmanned refueler is an exciting one for those involved, its makers say the potential for other types of missions make it a real difference maker. So you can pair this aircraft to do other missions besides just tanking and continue to grow the capability and capacity of the air wing of the future through those things. When it's all said and done, the Navy plans to add 76 Stingrays to their arsenal over the next few years. All opinions expressed in this segment are solely the opinions of the contributors. All right, folks, we are just about out of time for this episode of Weapons and Warfare. For my wrap this week, I want to talk about American leadership on the global stage and what at least one former enemy turned ally has to say about it. Earlier this month, the Prime Minister of Japan, Fumio Kishida, spoke to a joint session of the U.S. Congress. Kishida, a native of Hiroshima, recounted how he grew up viewing America through a post-World War II lens. In his words, Kishida said the U.S. shaped the international order through economic, diplomatic, military, and technological power. It championed freedom and democracy, encouraged the stability and prosperity of nations, including Japan, and when necessary, the U.S. made noble sacrifices to fulfill its commitment to a better world. Kishida said U.S. policy was based on the premise humanity does not want to live oppressed by an authoritarian state, and that freedom is the oxygen of humanity. While this may be our past, there's no guarantee we Americans can or will continue to carry this legacy forward. During his remarks, Kishida said he could detect an undercurrent of self-doubt among some Americans about what our role should be. For Kishida, and indeed many U.S. allies around the world, that self-doubt has terrible timing. The international order that the U.S. worked for generations to build is facing new challenges. Challenges from those with values and principles very different from ours. Kishida is absolutely right when he said the world is at an inflection point. Ukraine, Israel, Taiwan, the South China Sea, Guyana, things are dicey. And no matter how much we may want diplomatic solutions to prevail, Sometimes, the other side just doesn't. In today's world, that means the systems that brought peace and prosperity to so many people are literally under attack by a new axis of evil in Russia, China, North Korea, and Iran. As the world's foremost democracy, 
Democratic allies look to the United States to lead when things get dicey, and they should. But let's also be clear about one thing, and this is for the America should not be the world police crowd. Being a leader doesn't mean going it alone. That's being a lone wolf or a rogue nation. Being a leader means taking charge, so others will follow, so they can help bear the burden of that leadership. Kishida knows this. He said as much during his address to Congress. Calling Japan the closest friend America has, Kishida said Japan stands shoulder to shoulder with the United States. Because upholding the values of freedom and democracy isn't just the right thing to do, it's in Japan's best interest. Democracies, like people, are stronger when they stand together. So while some in the United States continue to bemoan the role we play in foreign affairs and wars overseas, remember, it was American leadership that created and sustains the international rules-based order that ushered in the greatest period of peace and prosperity in human history. And it will be American leadership, or lack thereof, that will determine whether the next period of human history is as peaceful or prosperous. And that's going to do it for us here at Weapons and Warfare. As always, if you have a comment or question you'd like to share, you can leave it in the comment section below or email us at weaponsandwarfare at san.com. For senior producer Brett Baker, video editor Brian Spencer, and graphic designer Dakota Patillo, I'm Ryan Robertson with Straight Arrow News, signing off. Thank <laughs> you.